Dukkha. Can we say that together? Dukkha. Dukkha is an interesting word that's almost impossible to translate into English. Usually, and unfortunately, it gets translated as suffering. But the word suffering has so much baggage uh, in our culture. It's two words put together. The first, du, is where you get the English word dirty. And ka is from the compound term akasha, or akash, which is the Sanskrit word for space. So dukkha means a dirty space, which is that space in us that cannot be satisfied. That inside of all of us, there is something that can't be satisfied. It's moments of time built into our experience, or constructed by our experience, when we feel a sense of lack, that something is missing. And all of us try to fill up that space any way we can. You try to fill up that space with your Facebook friendships. Oh, if I just have enough friends, then I'll be okay. We try to fill up that space with romantic love. Anybody heard of this, romantic love? Okay. Not so much in Ireland. In North America, we have this thing called Hollywood that has produced romantic love, or the absence of it. So one of the fantasies of romantic love is that one person is going to satisfy that lack in the center of my life. And if you've ever tried romantic love, you know that it doesn't work actually. I'm all for romance. I'm a romantic myself. But also to rely on someone else or to rely on a way of being seen, it's almost like that inner five-year-old we all have that just wants to be liked. And if I'm just liked, then everything's okay. But actually, it's not. Because the inner absence of satisfaction is actually built in to the self. Because the self can't ever be grounded. Because the self is a story. Or a conglomeration of stories. So it's always anxious. Because it can't get grounded. You see? And this dovetails so beautifully with consumerism. Because if I can't get grounded, then if I buy something, or if I get enough capital, right, then I'll be secure. Like there's a time of the year in Canada where the banks do a lot of advertising to invest in retirement plans. Do they do that here in Ireland? Yeah, and all the, and all the advertising <coughs> preys on your fear that you will not have enough money when you're older. But actually, there is something more existential at play there, which is that really it's touching that fear in us that we're not at home. We're not home. You see? So good advertising figures out how to get into that space. In the Tibetan tradition, there is a teaching about dukkha called the hungry ghosts. And the idea in The Hungry Ghosts, and if you see this in art, it's really amazing, the, the, the uh, visual rendition of this mythology, which is there's a big banquet table. So it's like cinnamon down the road. Has anybody here been to cinnamon down the road? They have every dessert you could ever imagine piled up in this big, huge pile that probably if you had even just a hundredth of a piece, you would go into a coma. <laughs> So there's this big banquet table with all of this food, and sitting around the banquet table are all of these ghosts with very thin necks. Their necks apparently are so thin that they couldn't even get rice, one grain of rice, down their throat. 
and their lips are parched, and they're so hungry. And they're carrying very long utensils that are five feet long. So when they go to the banquet and they pick up the food, they can't get it in their mouth. So they're so hungry. And it's said that you are a hungry ghost, that you have in you this insatiable appetite, this wanting that cannot be satisfied. And the paradox of the image of the five foot long spoon <clears throat> is that what they don't realize is that if you have a five foot long utensil, you could feed other people. But when you're so obsessed with your own wanting, you, you, you don't even see other people. You don't even know that other people have needs. I'm sure you've had a lover say this to you. You're so self-centered, you don't even realize I have needs too. <laughs> okay, maybe that's my own biography. <laughs> <laughs> That's why relationships are so terrible. Because other people will point out your self-centeredness. Because in your self-centeredness, you can't see them. And that's why relationships are so painful and why they're so healing. So, in the heart of life is this experience of dukkha. And one of the core teachings of the Buddha, often misunderstood, is that when dukkha is present, our practice is to embrace it. So when there is this sense of not being satisfied, our work is to open to the experience of dukkha without trying to fill it up. Because we start to see that when you have craving, right, the craving component of dukkha, when craving is present, nothing can satisfy it. Imagine this. Imagine you're walking downtown. You're in Temple Bar. And you walk by a store with a beautiful pair of shoes. And you say to yourself, And then you, and, and you don't say this out loud, because you're a yogi, you're not supposed to like shoes. And you say to yourself, if I had a pair of shoes like that, I would for sure have a husband. <laughs> <laughs> or a better husband. <laughs> okay. So, what the yogi does is instead of seeing that the arising and absence of craving is something you talk yourself into or out of, Instead, the yogi sees the shoes and sees how beautiful the shoes are, but just opens up to the experience of craving and says, oh, this is what craving feels like. You see? So you pull the energy away from the object and you just open up, oh, this is what wanting feels like. Just like yesterday when we talked about the riding the wave practice, you ride the wave of the wanting. And then the yogi is doing a deeper practice, which is the renunciation practice, which is learning how to open to wanting until you can experience the cessation, niroda, or the absence of wanting. And then you're really working with the knot of dukkha. You see? 